Hello and welcome to Social Emotional Learning for Social Justice. My name is Pierce Delahunt. I'm a, an activist educator. I'll share a little bit about myself before we jump in. I have a Master of Education from the Institute for Humane Education. I've been working with uh, various uh, types of activist education programs for 10 years. I call myself a social emotional leftist and describe what I teach as socialist emotional learning. That is to say that I believe that uh, social emotional learning is the interpersonal expression and uh, socialist politic is the institutional expression of really the same thing, which uh, I might describe as relationality. You need both the interpersonal and institutional in order for them to re reinforce each other. Um, otherwise, uh, they'll work against each other, however the case may be. Uh, the fact that you can go through a number of social emotional learning courses or programs and uh, walk out of there never necessarily needing to know that uh, systemic oppression exists or that racism is a thing or sexism or any of the other systemic oppressions, I think that's a problem that we need to address in our, in our social emotional learning. And we're going to go into that. And I'm grateful to uh, offer this to y'all. Cool. So we're going to take a look at how uh, the mainstream individualist social emotional learning principles lend themselves to social justice uh, when we apply a group analysis. And that's the key component is that uh, most often we're looking at an individualist model of social emotional learning. Let's jump in. How do we get from social emotional learning to social justice? We're going to start with the, uh, the more mainstream individualist take where you have a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And almost always in social emotional learning, it is presumed that that relationship is on an equal power footing. Those relationships can be uh, complex and nuanced in and of themselves. And it is true that it is also a super simplistic model of how we relate to people. But so this is the model of most individualist social emotional learning is how do I relate to the single person in front of me? Um, and what does that mean? And what does that look like? These can be easier to understand if you see, you know, a, a person uh, yelling and berating another person on the street, you might think, yeah, there's clearly some kind of, uh, of harm or abuse of power or something going on there. Um, and there are all kinds of complications to that. But I think in general, we could all see that situation playing out with just a one-on-one -on -one relationship and say like, maybe someone, maybe me, maybe myself should step in and do something about that. Um, but of course, we don't operate just on a one-on-one -on -one relationship. We live in a community. So we have a lot of relationships with a lot of people who all have relationships with each other and, and other people too. Um, and then this is where it gets really complicated. In, in a situation like this, the individualist mainstream social emotional learning uh, will say that if everyone in this community is uh, getting along well and, and has fulfilling and nourishing lives and relationships with each other, no one ever has a conflict. Well, that would be basically the end game of most uh, social emotional learning programs. You won, you beat the game of social emotional learning. Uh, congratulations, thank you for playing. I would argue that that is insufficient. We're gonna, we're gonna look at this mob, this community where everyone has these nourishing uh, relationships and, and lives. Um, and we're gonna call that community A. Now, uh, if that community uh, has these nourishing and fulfilling lives and relationships, meanwhile, another community we'll call community B uh, does not. Um, I would describe that as a problem in and of itself. And all too often, community A has these fulfilling lives and relationships precisely because community B does not. They have community A is benefiting at the expense of community B's ability to have those same nourishing uh, lives and relationships. Um, so you can already see kind of, I think, where I'm going with this, that community A is what we might call a privileged group and community B is the oppressed group. Um, now in this model though, right, they're, they're isolated communities uh, siloed from each other. So how, how is this happening if they're siloed like this? And all too often, 
It is because there is a third community that we're going to call Community C that is the enforcer group or the oppressors that take something from Community B to the benefit of Community A. Um, and that can be all kinds of things. That can be wealth, resources, uh, natural resources. It can be labor, all manner of uh, things that might benefit the privileged group Community A. And of course, this uh, is, you know, three siloed uh, communities. But in reality, of course, we're dealing with a three, three circle Venn diagram. And uh, you have Community C enforcing uh, the, the power differential, the political differential between communities A and communities B. Now, that can, we can apply this to all kind, manner of, uh, of oppressions, right? So take a, a global approach. We might be looking at uh, imperialism, where community A would be uh, especially the United States, but other uh, global north slash western nations. Um, and community B, the oppressed group, uh, would be the quote-unquote global south. Um, and, and colonized and imperialized nations, whereas Community C, I would describe that probably as the military in that example. Capitalism, which would be uh, Community A would be the privileged group, would be the, the wealthy, uh, whereas B would be the oppressed group, would be poor and working class, and the uh, oppressors uh, in that case would be the ruling class or the government. There's a distinction between the ruling class and, and the owning class. Uh, ruling class being significantly more wealthy and powerful than, than the owning class. And in racism, we have uh, the uh, privileged group being white folk, the oppressed group being uh, people of color, especially uh, uh, black and indigenous folk. Um, and uh, the enforcers or oppressors in that uh, example uh, could go a number of different ways, but I would certainly include law enforcement in that. In sexism, we'd have the privileged group being men, the oppressed group being uh, women and gender non-conforming folk, uh, and uh, the oppressors there, I would, uh, for one example, would be uh, sexual assaulters. And in uh, the example of ableism, uh, we would have uh, the privileged group uh, being able-bodied folk, uh, the oppressed group being disabled folk. Uh, and there's a lot of vari variety of different kinds of ableism uh, within that group. I want to acknowledge that. Uh, and then the oppressor or enforcer group there might be, uh, depending, uh, that could be the government or capitalists, uh, by which I mean uh, the, the owning class, not just anyone who is pro-capitalism. That's a distinction for another time. Speciesism, I know I've drawn humans, right? Um, but uh, we, can, we can imagine any of these beings being non-human animals as well, or, or other life forms too. Uh, so the privileged group would be humans, uh, the oppressed group would be non-human animals and other, other non-human life forms, and then the oppressor group, uh, I would name fast food executives as, uh, as a key group there. And then uh, environmental destruction, uh, the privileged group again being humans in that case, uh, and the uh, oppressed group being the ecosystem of life on Earth. And uh, the oppressor group there being, I would say, especially fossil executives, fossil fuel executives. And then, of course, I tend to teach this at schools. So I want to name uh, just a school setting where the privileged group might be popular students, right? Uh, and the oppressed group would be uh, those who are bullied. And the uh, oppressor or, or enforcer group in that example might be the bulliers in that way. Um, and that's just among students. We can talk about how faculty and admin play into that as well. So that, that's just some of that. And of course, all of those things are all happening at the same time. Um, and they're all, uh, you know, kind of a multidimensional uh, Venn diagram situation going on. And any given person will have varying identities and all of that. And so you can see then how from the principles of social emotional learning, of, of trying to be in right relationship with people, with each other and ourselves, uh, just applying a group analysis, we've gotten social justice. Here it is. And you can see here, this itself is a, a visual representation of the principles of social justice and intersectionality with all the, the varying identities at play there. There we have it. That's the basic idea. But how, what else, what other lessons from social emotional learning can we pull? Um, and how might that play out? Let's talk about what allows for conflict in an individualist social emotional learning setting. That brings me to the four D's of disconnection. This comes from uh, the work of Marshall Rosenberg and nonviolent communication. 
So the four Ds uh, that I refer to here are deny, deserve, diagnose, and demand. Um, so individual examples of this. And, and by the way, for with nonviolent communication, when we're talking about disconnection, we're talking about disconnecting from the needs of others or of ourselves. Um, so that's what's happening there. In a more interpersonal setting, to deny would be, for example, uh, gaslighting. Saying like, no, that didn't happen, or uh, you, you're you wrong in, in uh, your interpretation of events. Uh, I didn't do that or I don't have those needs or you don't have those needs or your the, your needs are met right to put it in the in the need based language we can even internalize things uh, to oppress ourselves in that way where I don't have those needs can come out as internalized capitalism I don't need to rest right I just need to work um, or it can come out as uh, internalized sexism like I I don't have any needs that would not uh, accommodate my partner right um, that's especially gendered. Whereas uh, we'll go to diagnose. So for diagnose, uh, I want to name that diagnosing can be a helpful thing, right? It can be really informative for us to understand uh, a situation. And diagnosing is a way that we can disconnect from needs. So for example, if someone were to say, I'm having this, this problem, this conflict, I want to talk to you about it. And then they say, uh, well, that's, that's just your, your trauma stuff coming up. That has nothing to do with me, right? Diagnosis is a way to deflect the accountability there. To, that would be, for example, an unhelpful diagnosis. Sometimes people do want, uh, want a diagnosis to, to help make sense of their situation. Um, but when we disconnect from needs in the diagnosis, then, then it's, a, it's a way to avoid accountability and, and uh, continue harm, perpetuate harm. In a group uh, setting or a systemic oppression setting, uh, you'll hear often uh, what's what's really wrong with whatever oppressed group is is in question. So, like you know, the real issue here is black on black crime, or how poor people don't want to better their situation. Now we're no longer talking about you know the fact that there is injustice happening or there are harms happening that we can stop. Now we're talking about and whether uh, we have any responsibility to do something about it at all. And that, that brings us from diagnosis to deserve. Now we're talking about whether it's, uh, it's something that they deserve, uh, those people. And so deserve is another excellent way to disconnect from needs because when we're talking about deserve, we're not even considering our needs at all, right? The, the very concept of a need is that there it is and we need it rather than figuring out you know who is owed what and it just asks uh okay well did what did you do to to meet my standards and now it places us in the role of gatekeeper deserve is huge on reward and punishment that's the whole concept the united states loves to pride itself on being a meritocracy which you know i would argue that the united states is not and the very concept of a meritocracy is one that is a model of who deserves what uh, with just a particular set of criteria of what it means to deserve what. The idea there with a meritocracy just being that those who work hard uh, or most get the most, um, which I would argue is not a very good model anyway. And then that is something we can also internalize. I, I don't deserve this. I do deserve that. I don't deserve this would be internalizing, you know, more shame and oppression, whereas internalizing the privilege, that's when entitlement comes out and that says, I do deserve this and I, I want that. Um, and that is owed to me. And then, you know, pointing the figure at other people, then we have, you know, you deserve to be criminalized. And there's a huge narrative in this country about, uh, what people deserve when we can be convinced that they are something that we call criminals. And then there's a talk around people deserving good things and what does that mean? And, and there's a strong sense of people with wealth got it precisely because they deserve it. The wealthiest people on the planet have what they have because they worked hard. And then we come up with uh, post hoc justifications for the fact that they have it. To, to explain, and that's a deserve uh, kind of thinking. And then finally, we have demand. Uh, and a demand is defined as a request that uh, is partnered with the threat of punishment. 
Um, so it's, it's not a request that someone is free to decline. In an interpersonal setting, that can just be telling someone to do something or else, quote unquote. Whereas in a systemic oppression, uh, now we're looking at law enforcement or the might of the uh, U.S. Army and its imperial aggression. There are very few things uh, that are more coercive than the might of the U.S. military and the threat to overthrow your, your nation's government. That's an extremely uh, coercive and, and demanding way to disconnect from the needs of an entire people. So those are the four Ds of disconnection. Now they're going to have some overlap with another model. This is this comes from nonviolent communication, the four Ds of disconnection. The other model is the four Ns of narrative. Uh, and those actually come from Melanie Joy, uh, who is a, a vegan activist. I don't know if she necessarily created them. And then the, the four Ns of narrative, we're talking about a narrative in the sense that, uh, as the thought bubble uh, demonstrates here, I have a story that... Uh, fill in the blank. So uh, those four ends of narrative can be normal, natural, nice, and necessary. And so we'll talk about those a little bit. So normal and natural, um, they're going to overlap a little bit with the deny and diagnose, right? If something is normal, then what's wrong, right? Uh, or if something is natural, what's wrong? Now, those are kind of logical fallacies, but those are really common justifications. And uh, nice is just about enjoying the thing. So if a, if a privileged person enjoys their privilege, well, then they don't have any responsibility to anyone else. And nice and necessary will uh, overlap more with deserve and demand. Um, you'll see that with the, the privilege being nice and I'm just going to enjoy mine and, and get mine. And necessary being, well, there's no other way. What can we do? I would argue that uh, to best... Uh, counter these narratives, uh, it is important to focus on necessary because however abnormal, unnatural, or mean something might be, if we believe it to be necessary, then there's not a whole lot we can do. Whereas if we chip away at the concept of something being necessary, then typically our imaginations will start to think of other things and then we'll come up with things that are more normal or more natural or more nice um, that, uh, that might work. And so, so I, I emphasize the importance of the necessary narrative. But yeah, all of these uh, narratives, I'm sure you may have, may, may have heard in some uh, context or another to justify uh, any one or more uh, of the systemic oppressions. This is just the way it is. Um, things have always been this way. I'm out here trying to do my best uh, or there, this is the best option and, and every other way is more... Uh, more harmful. So here we are. Uh, those, those kinds of narratives. The, those are the kinds of stories we might tell ourselves that disconnect from those needs. There was a, a really uh, wonderful interview, by the way, with uh, Trevor Noah on The Daily Show. He was interviewing Tarana Burke and Brene Brown about their work. And uh, Brene Brown posed the question, uh, what stories do we people of privilege tell ourselves um, that allows us to be okay with these things. And so these are the, the four categories of stories that we might be telling ourselves. Okay, we have then uh, an understanding of how people disconnect from their needs to let harm happen, as well as uh, execute harm themselves. Um, so what do we do about that? That brings me to something called ring theory, which is it's an individualist uh, social emotional learning type model. Um, but we're going to expand it into the, the social justice world uh, once we take a look at it. So this is ring theory here. The concept is comfort in or dump out. I've also seen care in or crap out. Uh, but the idea here is that at the center of the situation, we have uh, someone who is the most aggrieved or afflicted person, someone going through some hardship. Uh, this is often used in a, in a medical setting. So uh, someone, you know, in the hospital, for example, would be like the central person, uh, whereas then you have significant others and, and family. Um, and then you have like really close friends followed by, you know, less close friends or colleagues or coworkers. And then at the very outer ring, you have what are called looky loos you know, just people taking a, an interest out of curiosity of what's happening. And so the model here is that it is perfectly acceptable for any of these people, even a looky loo to have strong feelings about what is happening to the person uh, at the center of this, to the person in the hospital or the person, whatever, whatever harm they're experiencing. But they, they need to do that 
outward, right? They can they to for Lucky Lou to vent about how stressful it is uh, that the aggrieved person is in the hospital to the aggrieved person is just going to continue traumatizing that person. If a Lucky Lou is doing that to a fellow Lucky Lou or someone even more uh, distanced from the center, then there's no harm there, right? Uh, I would describe this personally as a as an individualist uh, representation of the concept, nothing about us without us. Uh, that's a common social justice refrain. Or we can also look at this as the, the model of, of sovereignty and self-direction, that uh, the person who is most affected or the group of people who are most affected have the most say about the situation. In what to do then about the fact that there is harm happening and there are these disconnections, um, I would argue that we need to listen to those people who are most affected by the harms in question. But I am myself uh, a, a wealthy, white, hetero, cis male, uh, very much a person in a variety of positions of privilege and power. And I have a lot of really strong feelings about all of these systemic oppressions. I have a lot of really strong feelings about capitalism, about uh, racism, about sexism, all of those things. And I'm, I'm not going to go around telling uh, poor and working class people or people of color or women and gender queer folk what to do about the situation, right? I'm going to listen to them and I'm going to talk to my fellow people of privilege. That's, that's my role. As an educator, I do go around talking to a lot of uh, people of various identities about these things, uh, but I, I wouldn't go to a, a community of color to tell them what to do about racism. That's a different thing. Um, so in, uh, in order to figure out what to do or to, to understand what to do, I, we need to center those who are most affected. Um, and that is actually going to empower them, which is in and of itself uh, alleviating the harm of disempowerment in the first place. So that's a really important part. So that's, it's called ring theory. It's, uh, that's the individualist representation uh, that, again, we're taking into a group analysis. And here we have it. There's social justice. Now we know uh, to listen to those who are most affected. That's the principal takeaway from how to, uh, uh, from where to look to, in order to understand what to do about these things. What do the, what do the actions that we might take look like? And that brings me to the five D's of disruption, uh, which uh, this comes out of uh, the work I've seen from Hala back. I don't know if they created it, but I got it from them. Uh, they're an anti-street harassment group, really, really awesome stuff. Um, so the five D's of disruption, uh, we're looking at, we'll, we'll talk about the first four, document, distract, delegate, and delayed. So in this example, we're talking about documenting the, uh, the instance of harm, right? In an, in an individualist setting, if, if uh, using a school example for seeing uh, someone, uh, one student bully another, maybe we'll record it. And then, and so that way we can use that to go to a teacher or, or something, whatever the case may be. Um, if we're, if we're going to distract, that could be, you know, uh, asking in the, in the street harassment model, it's typically uh, asking the person who's doing the harassing for direction somewhere in a school that might be asking the bullier for uh, help with the homework or what, what the homework was or something like that. Uh, that. That just distracts the person instigating the harm from being able to continue the harm, right? Um, and then delegate. Maybe we're not comfortable stepping in, right? But maybe we know someone who would be or, or is more comfortable. And so then in that situation, we can call upon someone else or a delayed situation, right? Maybe we didn't feel comfortable stepping in right in that moment. Um, but afterward, we can check in with either the person who was bullied or the person who was doing the bullying. And we can say like, hey, like I, I was really scared to step in, but I saw what happened. Like, are you OK? What's going on to the person who was bullied? Um, to the person who was doing the bullying, we can say like, hey, I was uh, like really scared to step in in that moment, but I, I saw it and I want you to know that that's not okay. Like if you need to to address something going on, like I, I can talk to you. Uh, I would love to talk to you about ways that we can get your needs met that don't involve bullying someone because that that needs to stop. And so that that's why I put in there in the parentheses under disruption. It's about boundary setting, right? In nonviolent communication, which is the, the model of social emotional learning that I most pull from, 
the uh, distinction that we set is one between the punitive use of force and the protective use of force, right? So in all of these examples, we're not actually interested in, in harming the person who's doing the harm. That's just perpetuating a cycle of harm, right? We're just trying to stop the harm. And so that means connecting to our needs, helping others connect to their needs, and then trying to get those needs met. That's what's at play here. So in, in any of these uh, examples with, a, with a, an institutional look, uh, we might be looking at document, meaning, uh, you know, record whatever harm. Uh, also, recording the attempts to uh, repair the harm. So if we're trying to go through official channels, right, if we're trying to uh, say this is wrong and, and so uh, we took it to the government and, and this was their response, then, then we can say, like, we tried the thing that uh, everyone is telling us to do and it didn't work. So we need to do something else. And that's an important part of the process is document. Distracting is a little more complicated, usually more in the institutional sense, usually more when there's some some kind of political measure at play um, or when they're at the uh, at the level of businesses that are profiting off of some kind of harm. Uh, the more that we can uh, pull energy away from quote unquote business as usual, the more we can get them to deal with, no, we're here and now you have to deal with a bunch of protesters uh, that are chanting uh, on your property or whatever the case may be. Now you have to deal with that. That's uh, pulling from their uh, attempt to to extract more wealth. Um, so that's one example. Delegating. My favorite example of delegating is uh, to just donate, right? It's, it's saying, I believe you, whoever I'm donating to, whether you're a person or an org, I believe you are better positioned to leverage this money that I'm donating than I am at this moment. So delegating is, uh, is a way to do that. Also, uh, one of my favorite examples is uh, uh, whistleblowers, leakers. Uh, they're, they're saying like, uh, here's something that, that I have discovered and now I'm putting it onto the public. I'm, I'm telling other people about it so that they can uh, take action uh, about it. So that's delegating. And then delayed. Personally, I think two of the best examples of delayed uh, disruption of harm at the level of, of the institutional stuff is um, one is reparations. Uh, we cannot stop the harm that has happened, right? Uh, the U.S. Uh, state sanctioned human trafficking system uh, that continues to be the foundation of the U.S. economy. Um, but we can uh attempt to make some kind of repair or compensate for that injustice with, with reparations. Um, and then another example uh, of delayed uh, disruption would be uh, going through, we have in this country a backlog of what are called rape kits or sexual assault kits that are unprocessed. They're a backlog. We have hundreds of thousands of them that, with, that forensics have not gone through. And we could, we cannot stop those harms, those sexual assaults from having occurred, but we can, with the the kits that do exist right now, we can go through those and attempt to make some kind of repair at the injustices that had already happened. And then that brings me, of course, to our fifth disruption, which is right there in front of us, direct action. In the interpersonal school bullying example, that's just going in and saying like, hey, this needs to stop. I'm going to check in with the person who was bullied first and talk to them, like, how are you doing? Do you need anything? Then we go into talk with the bully, or maybe there's more than one person at a, at a time, but that's going in there and stopping the harm. Direct action at the institutional level can look a lot of different ways. Blockades, uh, stopping whatever business as usual thing is happening uh, as one example, occupations, right? Uh, Occupy Wall Street or, or, or Occupy ICE. Um, those were uh, great examples of, of uh, direct actions. Sit-ins uh, are a great uh, uh, direct action. Whatever kind of, of situation where we're going in, we're saying this harm needs to stop. That's the uh, example of direct action. Now, that's all saying, setting boundaries, a matter of connecting to our needs and saying, we need this to stop because this is violating our needs. And we, we can talk about other strategies to meet all, all of the needs at play, but this absolutely needs to stop. Great. So in this, all of these examples of, uh, of the ways that we can disrupt, they all require us to uh, communicate and be in relationship with each other. Um, and so that's, that's, that's where some of that uh, individual social emotional learning stuff comes in. Um, but in figuring out how do we relate to each other, I do want to refer to a model 
of activist archetypes. This comes from the work of Bill Moyer, the activist, not to be confused with Bill Moyers, the journalist. Um, and he has a, a model, it's called the Movement Action Plan. Um, but in that model, he emphasizes that there are four, what he calls activist archetypes, uh, who can be either effective versions of those archetypes or ineffective versions of those archetypes. Very commonly and more well-known probably is the tension between the rebel and the reformer, right? Uh, the rebel being the kind you see on the street that's doing a lot of the protesting and the reformer being the kind of person, kind of activist who works in those uh, official uh, nonprofits. So you can imagine the tension that might exist between them. But very importantly, the movement needs all of these people. And all of these people need to be working together to push the movement forward uh, efficiently. And there are, there are ways that you can do any one of these roles well or uh, less well. That individualist social emotional learning that comes in most handy in terms of the, uh, the ways that it can contribute to the movement is how do we get these people uh, working together? Um, another model that kind of gets to that, that speaks to that is this one of how nonviolent action works. Um, the idea here is that there's a continuum of people who are working uh, with or against us, as the case may be, uh, and that uh, wherever the person is on that continuum, we need to relate to them maybe a little differently or that the goals are different, whatever the situation may be. I'll just describe a little bit here. We have the opponents uh, where we want to uh, arouse doubts and conflict. Uh, with it, whereas the the neutral category, the neutrals, we want to win over those people. And then the people who are already working with us, well, great, now let's uh, increase the cohesion there. That's the idea there. And we're all working on the decision makers in question. And the very fact that there are decision makers uh, for some of these uh, systemic oppressions, I would argue, is the problem, right? The We need actually the decision makers to give up their power and, and give it to uh, the people most affected. That brings us to uh, a little bit more of that, uh, how do we relate to each other stuff, the, the relational science uh, that these things are pulled from a lot of what, was, uh, what has been learned and developed in marketing. I'm not a big fan of marketing as a concept or as a field, but uh, the, the value of what they have discovered in relational science is, uh, is, very, is really valuable. Um, so the, the big thing I would argue with uh, the, the relational science as per our conversation is that um, any time that we are engaging with someone, they're relating to us at the level of the cause in question, uh, the experience of working with that cause and the identity of what it means to be a person who is working toward that cause. And uh, the key uh, takeaway here is that we are engaging with them at all three levels at the same time, always. There's no, there's no getting around that. The example in marketing is typically, uh, to, to make this maybe a little more concrete and clear, is uh, usually coffee, right? So if the cause is that uh, I'm selling coffee and I want you to buy it, right? I might tell you then at the, of the like how good the coffee is, right? Uh, and why you should buy this coffee. Um, or the, the level of experience, well, uh, like when you hang out at my cafe and buy from my, my coffee, uh, like, you know, my cafe has, has massage chairs that are really great and like cozy uh, atmosphere or aesthetic or whatever. And so you'll have a really good time. And then the identity will like, you know, my cafe, like everyone who uh, buys coffee at my cafe, they're all the creative professional type, like, you know, all working on their screenplays. And so when you're at, at my cafe and you're buying my coffee, you'll meet all those people and then you'll be one of those creative professionals by networking with them and, and all that and so now you've become a creative professional by going to my cafe and buying my coffee so at the movement level uh we're we're always uh relating to people at the level of the cause the experience and the identity all three at the same time always um so in in that way then we want to be uh you know with someone who's receptive obviously we're like we're not going to waste our time with uh people who are just not going to hear us out um but we want to be sensitive to uh, them and their needs, right? Because if we're not, then we're telling them that the identity of someone who works for this cause is one that does not care about their needs. And so then why would they join this movement? And that is just one reason why I would argue that any one of these causes, any one of these movements need to be intersectional. Because, um, for instance, as a, this is a common tension, 
uh, if, uh, if I'm a white vegan, which I am, but if I'm a white vegan and I'm talking to a person of color, why they need to be vegan. And I'm totally insensitive to, uh, their, uh, their interests as a person of color, then they will understand that, oh, okay. The vegan movement is one that is not interested in, in my needs as a person of color. It's not a movement for me. Right. And now I want to be clear that I, I'm in no way saying that like the reason that a vegan movement needs to uh, be interested in racism is to recruit vegans of color. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm using that as an example of how uh, we are relating to people always at all, at all levels, including at the level of identity. I absolutely believe in uh, racial justice for its own sake. I want to make that clear. That's a little bit of, of how we need to be relating to each other and ourselves uh, in this movement. If we're ever stuck, if we're ever not sure about what it is we need to do, um, we can always refer to, I call these the three always things. Uh, we can always learn more. If we're not sure what we want to learn about, the example uh, or the, the guidance I like to give on that is uh, to pick a topic that you're already familiar with and passionate about, maybe know a lot about it and see how it intersects with uh, an issue we're less familiar with. I think that's a great way to start branching out and to understand uh, those issues. So the learning is one of the, the always things. The next one is support, right? Maybe if, I, if all I ever do as an activist is help other activists who are sick, I just make them soup and get them tea, uh, I will have contributed to the movement. And there are enough activists out there that uh, there's always someone who needs that kind of support. Um, just listening to other activists, they're, you know, they're struggling. Maybe they have a lot on their shoulders that they haven't uh, talked about or, or uh, you know, vented out lately. Um, so just, just holding space for them in that work, that's huge. Um, so if we're not sure what to do, we can always learn more. We can always support others. And then the third, what I call always thing is engaging, engaging with other people, whether wherever they are in this continuum, whether they're opponents or neutrals or allies, just have these conversations, get other perspectives, uh, tease out the, the dialectics of the issue um, and try to understand uh, more than we went in knowing. Um, if we're engaging with uh, a quote unquote opponent, right? Uh, then I would, uh, I would advise not to try to convince that person of anything. I think that is a, a good way to get frustrated. Um, whereas instead, what I would say in terms of when engaging with an opponent, um, uh, is to just practice being in relationship with them, hearing them out, um, and, and focusing on that, um, and learning what their uh concerns and talking points are and then using that as an opportunity to practice our talking points um but but prioritizing the relationship uh is is key especially if that's someone you have a longer term relationship with or we'll see again um if it's uh if it's a one-off interaction then maybe you know just use that opportunity as a way to practice your talking points um but even so know that uh if they're leaving that interaction thinking like I don't feel heard, then, uh, then maybe that uh, is not contributing to the movement. It depends on the situation. But of course, uh, don't put the burden or the weight of, of winning them over all on that one interaction. Uh, going back to the relational science stuff, uh, marketers understand that no one commercial, for instance, is going to convince someone to buy a car or whatever the product might be, right? Uh, that it's it's about a lot of exposures uh, and developing comfort and familiarity and a relationship and rapport with the people that they're they're interacting with. That's what the work is essentially is um, is a lot of that, uh, and that's that's why it, one of the reasons why it's hard. Uh, it it tends to be more tedious and uh, and boring than people imagine. It's not all. Uh, super dramatic in the struggle, right? Um, but, uh, but that is the work. Those are the three always things. If you're ever stuck, uh, those are the things we can always do. Um, just going to walk you through some resources. Uh, so we can, uh, if, if you're interested in any of this, uh, I invite you more to explore these more. Um, this here is me. You can check out my social media. That's my link tree up here. Uh, my handle on any social media is De La Pierced. It's a combination of my uh, given and surname. 
Um, then uh, the, if you're interested in this conversation, that's the article, Social Emotional Learning for Social Justice. It'll have a recording of this video on there uh, as well as like more detailed uh, write-up. Um, I have an article on anti-socialism, which is what I call capitalism. Um, and it's, uh, it has more of a, a social emotional learning kind of feel to it. You'll, you'll see that if you look through it. Um, there's a graphic there more on if you're not so familiar with the, the uh, anti-capitalist analysis. Um, there's, that's a great infographic uh, there. The anti-socialism article will also help with that and has that infographic in it. Um, and then if you're interested more in the, the nonviolent communication stuff, of course, I recommend the book Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. It's excellent. Uh, actually, my favorite book on the topic of nonviolent communication is this one here, Decolonizing Nonviolent Communication, written by Minachi. Um, they also run an org uh, called Trauma Informed Nonviolent Communication. It's excellent. Uh, strongly recommend that. Um, and then I do want to name that nonviolent communication uh, has been misused and uh, has a reputation among some for uh, the ways that it has been misused. So I offer uh, the nonviolent communication and the structural power analysis. It's an interview with Marshall Rosenberg, the founder, where he explains uh, why we still need a structural power analysis uh, when using nonviolent communication. That, that definitely addresses some of those things. And that, that's a longer conversation too. Um, but, uh, but that's an excellent video uh, to, uh, to help understand uh, how and why some nonviolent, nonviolent communication practitioners might be misusing it. Um, and then nonviolent communication activists, that's a, a talk that I have given. Uh, it has some interactive exercises. Uh, so it's, it has the social emotional learning stuff in the context of uh, doing the social justice work. Um, and then the last three are really great uh, resources on better understanding anti-capitalism uh, in general. Um, more, more traditional anti-capitalist analysis, not so much the social emotional learning stuff, but, uh, but still really good. Um, the Richard Wolff video is my favorite from him to start with. Uh, Marx's Capital Illustrated is an excellent resource that is not nearly as overwhelming and hard to read as uh, Marx's Capital original. Uh, the, the comic book version is uh, more than most anyone else needs. Um, and then the Mumbo Jump is just a glossary for your reference. So I, I offer these resources to you. Uh, you'll have a link to the slides where you can go through these. Um, and I so appreciate your, your coming and, and thank you for, for listening. Appreciate it. Cheers.